Good morning, everyone. Good Good to see everybody here today. Um, Hope you enjoyed your extra hour of sleep. Don't know if it's going to, you know, really help with the getting darker earlier or not. Don't know how that kind of works out, you know, in our favor or not. But anyway, good to see everybody here today. Um, Before we continue our journey through the book of Ephesians, um, I I just want to make just a comment or two uh, ahead of what is about to take place in our country come Tuesday, okay? Just, just a couple um, comments, and I know that many of you have probably voted already, and, and that's great. But first of all, I, I want to say as your pastor, I hope that we all uh, will exercise our right and our responsibility uh, to get out there and vote. Okay, and, and don't think that you can't make a difference. And else you, no, just let's do our, let's control what we can control, and that is to take advantage of the opportunity and the right and the privilege that we have to be able to vote. So we need to, we have to, we should. Some people will will say, "Man, I wish I could, you know, get my hands on you know a voter's guide before I vote." And there's plenty of them available out there. But I want to say this: there's there's no more important voter's guide than this book right here. Okay, um, and, and so I hope you I hope you understand that 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 is where we find our our truth. Um, let the word of God be your voters' guide. It's not about what's fresh. It's not about what's new. It's not about you know what you know you may even like or, or don't like. What does this book, the Bible, have to say about it? And then vote accordingly. Um, we we need our religious freedoms protected. And we need to vote according to the truth of the word of God. And then let me make one final comment and just remind everybody on Tuesday, uh, we are not voting for a savior. That, that role has already been fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he does a pretty good job of it. He doesn't need any help. Okay. So the, the Lord is, is on the throne. The Lord is going to remain on the throne. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm going to vote for the policies and agendas that best reflect my Jesus-formed values. And then I'm going to vote accordingly. So take it for whatever you're worth. Just want to to encourage you with those things today. That's all. The end. Moving on. Please open your Bibles, the copy of God's Word, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We finally made it into chapter 4 today. And um, we're going to be looking at the first six verses of chapter four here this morning. But before we get to that, I I wonder if you've ever really paid attention, those of you who have kids, have you ever really paid attention to how quick your kids grow up? (laughs) Right? Like, I seriously feel as if it was like yesterday that when we went on vacations, like we had to make sure that we were holding the hands of the girls and you stay right by my side and and don't leave me. And then the next thing you know, you blink and you have a 27 year old who's married and has two kids and made you a grandpa. You've got a 25 year old who's married and your baby's gonna be 22 in 10 days. And you're like, what in the world just happened, right? And I'll be honest and say that there are some things as a parent, as a dad, that I wish I could go back and do differently. But for the most part, not that we were perfect, but for the most part, Stephanie and I, we, we raised our girls very purposefully. We raised them on purpose. Because I don't know if you realize this or not, but your kids don't just grow up and love and serve Jesus on accident. Like, it's done on purpose. It's done by being intentional. Like, if we want our kids to grow up in Christ, as we're really going to get into today in chapter 4, that doesn't happen on accident. You've You've got to be purposeful in doing what you can as a parent to help your kids grow up in Christ. And as a pastor, I want the same thing to be said of our church. Like I want the people who call Bridge Point home to grow up in Christ, but guess what folks? That doesn't happen on accident. Like you've got to do that on purpose. You've got to be very intentional in growing up in Christ. And this is kind of what we're going to look at today. And hopefully that popping noise goes away if not 
then I just brought it to your attention. Okay, you're welcome. (laughs) Ephesians chapter 4, where we're going to be today, is better accomplished together. Together. it's, It's doing life with each other. It's helping each other grow up in Christ. It's keeping each other accountable to the things that should be true in our life. It's not going to be accomplished by going all Lone Wolf McQuaid or by any Lone Ranger or by being Hans Solo. See what I did there? I'm done. Moving on. But together. It's going to be best done together. And Ephesians chapter 4, if it's read, if it's understood correctly, and if it's applied can be very influential, impactful in the life of a Christian to help us figure out how we can grow up together in Christ. So write this down if you would please, if you're taking notes. Making our position and practice match is a together project. Like if that's the desire, if we want to make sure that our position being in Christ matches our practices because we're in Christ, that is best accomplished together. Now, now certainly there's parts that are individual. Like there's certain things that, that you and I need to do on our own and for ourselves, Like there's certain things that nobody's going to be able to do for you. There's certain things that nobody's going to be able to make you do if you don't want to do them. So there is an individual aspect. But please understand that God intended this project of growing up together in Christ to be a together project. Where we're helping each other do that. So before we go any further, let's honor the Lord by standing for the reading of God's word. Ephesians chapter 4. Beginning in verse 1, and we're only going to go down through the first six verses today. So Paul writes this. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for this passage of scripture that we've gotten to here at the beginning of chapter 4. And God, I pray that you would help me. God, help me to do the best that I can through your power in just helping us understand the importance of of putting into practice the things that we're going to see in this particular text for today. And God, I pray that everything that's said and done will bring honor and glory to you and will draw people to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of their sins. We ask all these things today in your son's precious name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Now, some of you are already thinking, now, Craig, how is this going to work today? Because there was a time a couple months ago where we're in the middle of our Acts series, and you preached for 40 minutes or so, and you covered 110 verses. How in the world are you going to preach for 40 minutes or so on just six verses? Watch me, all right? Watch me. This, is, this, is, this really is... The, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say like the, the rest of the chapter and the rest of the Bible just doesn't matter. But man, if there's, if there's any verses that we need to try to pour into and understand and apply to our life in order for us to be able to live effective Christian lives, it's the first six verses of Ephesians chapter 4. So let's go back to verse 1. Here we go. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling To which you have been called. So, what he's basically saying here, and what he's gonna get into today is this Hey, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, make sure your position and your practice matches. Right? You're not just in Christ by name only, but you should be in Christ with the way you choose to live your life. So, make sure your position and your practice matches. 
Are you in Christ? Yes, I'm in Christ. Live like it. Walk like it. Talk like it. Act like it. Treat people like you are in Christ. And this is what he's saying here, right? Paul, a prisoner for the Lord. So that means he's not there by accident. Like, Paul is where he is in prison writing this letter. He's there because God has him there. He is where God wants him to be at this particular time, what happens to be in prison. So the first seven words of verse 1, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord. Those first seven words give Paul credibility to say what he's about to say next. Because he's a prisoner for the Lord, he says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. In other words, I urge you to make sure your position and your practice matches. If you are going to be in Christ, make sure your position and your practice matches. Steph and I, we worked with teenagers for, for 15 years before I became the lead pastor of this church. And even over the last 15 years, we, we still have dabbled with working with teenagers, you know, off and on. And, and one thing I've learned about working with teenagers is you can have all the, all the best illustrations, all the best application. I mean, you can have the best sermon in the world, but if you don't have a relationship with those kids because there's no connection with those kids, if you say to a bunch of teenagers that you don't know, I urge you to do whatever, chances are they're going to look at you and think and maybe even say, who are you to tell me what to do? Right, But that's what Paul's doing here. Paul's saying, I urge you, why? Because he has a relationship with those people. Because he has a connection with those people. Because the old adage is still true. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. So Paul has this relationship, this incredible relationship. The Ephesian believers know how much Paul loves them. He's in prison for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says to them, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Make sure your practice and your position matches. So you who are here today, you who call Bridgepoint home, you who are watching online and call Bridgepoint home, you whom I hope it's becoming more and more evident, whom I love and care about so deeply, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. I urge you as the body of Christ, as the body of believers that make up Bridgepoint Church, I urge you to make sure that your position and your practice matches. That it matches. Because you are now in Christ, there is a certain way to live our lives in Christ. Here's another thing to write down if you're taking notes. We are called to walk together in a worthy manner. We're called to walk together in a worthy manner. So so what does that mean? To walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Well, first of all, I think we need to understand that as a believer, it is possible to walk in a manner that's not worthy. If it's possible to walk in a manner that is worthy of our calling, then that means it's possible to walk in a manner that's not worthy. And so as followers of Christ, we need to make sure that we are walking in the path that we should be walking in, and we are not walking in the path that we shouldn't be walking in. Like those are things that that, that you see immediately just from how this text is worded at this particular time. Look at the last part of verse 1. Of the calling to which you've been called. So we've all been called to something. So if we're called to something, that also then means that we're called away from something. Because you can't just have the best of both worlds here, right? You can't just live your life however you want to and think that, hey, I'm in Christ, therefore I'm good. If we are called to walk in a certain way, that means we are called to make sure that we're not walking in a certain way so far in this particular text. But according to verse 1, we're being called towards our calling. Like, what? Like, why are you repeating yourself right now? 
You know? Like, you, you are called to your calling. Okay? So what do you have to figure out? What's your calling? And I, and this, I don't mean like what's God's will for your life because that, that's going to be different for every single person. But as followers of Christ, you ready for this? We all have the same calling. You know what that is? Look like Jesus. That's the same calling that we're all called to. We are called to Christ likeness. So what he's going to do is as you are walking down that path in a manner worthy of the calling of being more Christ-like, some things are going to be found in our life. Some things are going to be evident in the way that you and I live our life in those particular moments. I mean, you think about another verse that Paul wrote in Galatians, it's no longer I who live, but in Christ, it's Christ Jesus who lives in me. Like that's the calling of everyone is to be Christ-like in the way we live our lives. So I got a question for you to consider. Is your life moving in a direction towards Christ-likeness? Because if it isn't, then you're not walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Because if you are going to walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling to which you've been called, you will become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 1 through 3 of Ephesians chapter 4 is one continual sentence in the English language. Look at it. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And then it goes right into some character traits. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Period. End of sentence. Finally. Now those things mentioned in those verses, they're not the calling. The calling is what? Christ-likeness. But as you walk towards that calling, these things in verses 2 and 3 should show up in your life. They should be evident in the way you live your life as a Christ follower. Let's let's look at these character traits there beginning in verse 2. And and let's just go through the list here, okay? The first one we see is with all humility. Now, humility might not be hard for everyone, but humility is hard for some. Like, it's hard. It's not necessarily the easiest thing uh, in the world to do, even though we should be humble and we're told to be humble. Now, what you need to understand is that many commentaries at this particular point in the text, when the writing of this text is taking place, humility was not something that was encouraged for people to go after. Like, in the Roman culture, it was all about status. It was all about power. It was all about, you know, you being so strong and doing everything you need to do. And I don't need anybody's help. So humility is frowned upon at this time. But Paul is saying the more you're going to walk to be like Jesus, the more humble you should be. The more that humility should be evident in the way you live your life. Humility wasn't valued at all. I just want people to understand that humility is not a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of Christ-likeness to be more like Jesus. What's the next one? With all humility and gentleness. How many of you have ever heard the phrase like a bull in a china shop? Anybody? Anybody? How many have ever been described that way yourself as a bull in a china shop, right? That, not a compliment, right? We know that's not a compliment. We're on the same page, right? Now, I'm not saying that this is true about you who have been told that you're like a bull in a china shop or anything like that. But being gentle, the opposite of gentle is walking over people. The opposite of gentle is running over people with no regard to how they feel. With, with how you are, in, just saying whatever you want and doing whatever you want. And you know what? Whatever happens, happens. It really doesn't matter. It's none of my concern. That's the opposite of being gentle. When you are gentle with someone, when that person sees you, they don't have to walk the other way to avoid you. When you're gentle with people, they don't see you in Kroger and, and walk three aisles over because they don't want to cross paths with you. Okay? 
when we're gentle. And we need to be gentle with each other in this journey to being Christ-like. That doesn't mean that things go unchecked. That doesn't mean that things go unaddressed or ignored. But I say this a lot to people. There's always a right and a wrong way to say what you need to say. But be gentle in your approach to them. What we do and say should be marked with humility. It should be marked with gentleness. Also, the third thing we see in that verse is patience. (laughs) Some of you may have jumped off the train with humility. Others departed when we started talking about gentleness. Now, patience has probably caused a lot of people to get off the train right now, right? Other versions use a word instead of patience that actually provides a great definition of patience. Long-suffering. Are you long-suffering? Or are you quick to give up on people? Are you quick to write people off? Or are you patient and long-suffering with anybody, to be honest with you? Do you know what makes patience so hard? It's because it involves waiting. And nobody likes to wait. I was in Food Town a couple weeks ago. And I'm pretty sure I was in the 10 items or less lane. I don't know how many items you actually can take in there or not, but that's the one I always choose regardless of how many items I have. And so I'm standing in line and the guy in front of me is the most anxious and antsy person I've been around. Like there's a couple of people in front of us and he's like walking around and he's looking and he keeps looking like, why is this line not going any faster than it is? And, and he's just going, he's huffing and puffing. What I wanted to say to him, I didn't, but what I wanted to say to him, because I didn't know if he had ever visited Bridgepoint Church or not, so I didn't. And, and I wanted to say, my friend, if you were a, a little better with your time management, you might not be so impatient. I didn't say that to him, but I wanted to, right? We are not naturally very patient people. But Paul writes that if you, on your journey to being Christ-like, not only do you need to be humble, not only do you need to be gentle, but hey, you better figure out sooner than later how to be patient. (laughs) How to be patient with people. The more we become like Christ, the more patience should be seen in our lives. I am not implying for one second that if you're still an impatient person that you don't love Jesus. Okay, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that the more you become like Jesus, the more patient you'll become. The more humble you'll become. The more gentle we're supposed to become. Humility needs to be seen in our lives. Gentleness and patience should be seen in our lives. What's the last one at the end of verse 2? Bearing with one another in love. Now, once again, another version of the Bible uses the word enduring. Like you endure people. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have a lot of endurance these days. You know, even at just 52. You know, there's not a whole lot of endurance in my life. And a lot of you guys know this story. And I used, to, I used to run a little bit, okay? But the last 5K I ran, the Rose Run, the last 5K I ran was my last race because I got, pu- I got passed by a mom pushing a stroller and my mother-in-law. <laughs> now, let's just, why are you guys clapping for that? Now, let's just call it like it is. My mother-in-law is the epitome of the Energizer Bunny, okay? So I didn't feel as bad about that as being pushed or being passed by some mom in a stroller and the kids looking at me like, what are you even doing out here, you know? But I don't have, I don't have very much endurance these days. Um, I, I'm not a big, I'm not a huge hiking fan, although we seem to do a lot of it on vacation, you know, like, oh, Craig, no, you got to do this. And I know it's 10 miles straight up the hill, but man, when you get up to the top, the views are to die for. And I'm like, but what if I die before I get to the top? Right? Are you got with me? I mean, just endurance, right? 
Now, I know this isn't quite the same definition of endurance that we're talking about here, but I just want you to know that on your journey to becoming more and more like Christ, there's a chance that you're going to have to endure people. You're going to have to bear with one another in love. You know what that means also? You're going to have to put up with people. So, so this isn't necessarily talking about just loving when everything's easy. This is talking about loving when it's hard. Loving someone that is, is proving to be unlovable. That's what he's talking about right here. And, and it kind of carries the idea of taking on the weight of something for someone else. So that means at times, you know what? You're going to have to carry the weight of hurt, carry the weight of misunderstanding, carry the weight of immaturity, carry the weight of selfishness. God may call you as you're walking together in Christ's likeness too with humility and with gentleness and with patience to bear with one another in love. These things mentioned here in verse 2, they're not extra things on the journey. They are the journey. They are the things that should be found in our lives. Verse 3. This is where it gets really interesting. Eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So humility is hard. Gentleness is at least hard for some. Patience is hard for many. Bearing with one another in love has most likely brought somebody to your attention that you're really struggling with right now. And now this one, eager to maintain unity. Do you know why that's so hard to do? It's because people, even Christians, will find a way to fight and argue about anything. Anything. Like, It's almost like what some people live to do, which to be honest with you, I don't really care to be around those type of people, but that was all extra and free. Eager to maintain unity. So the verse is not just saying to, hey, Christian, let's make sure that we're maintaining the unity. No, the verse is saying to be eager to maintain the unity. When I think of the word eager, some of y'all are going to think I'm crazy, but some of y'all already know I'm crazy. When I think of the word eager, I think of the price is right. (laughs) Some of you are with me. You're tracking. And and trust me, I've watched a lot of prices right in my day when I would stay home from school and, and fake sick. You know what I'm talking about back in the day, right? But think about it. Eager. Have you ever one time, just one time, when someone got their name and said, come on down, where they were like this. <sighs> Can't believe I got called to come down here and win $32,000 worth of prizes. And Has that happened ever in the history of the Price is Right? I don't think so. When someone gets their name called down, they immediately lose all control of their body and their senses, right? They are just acting a fool. They don't care that they're acting a fool. They kiss the person next to them, whether they know them or not, and they just run all the way down front, and they're going crazy, and they can't breathe, and they don't even know what they're bidding on, and they say one dollar and most of the time lose, right? (laughs) That's what I think of when I think of eager, Like, like you are so excited, and you can't wait to play a part to maintain the spirit of unity. Now, please understand in these verses, he didn't say, hey, be eager to have God bless you with a whole bunch of blessings, even though I hope he does, and there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't say, be eager to have your life work out exactly how you want your life to work out, and I hope it does. But he's saying, be eager to maintain the spirit of unity. Why? Because God knows how important that is. He understands how important it is for us to be unified as believers, as followers of Christ, as being in Christ. We need to be eager. Now, it's not just that, though. Look at the verse. To be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. 
So why are we eager to receive the blessings of God, but we sometimes aren't eager to maintain a spirit of unity? Especially when the spirit of unity is of the utmost importance to God. Now let me tell you what I'm not saying. And and I don't know if I did a real good job of this in the first service, just understanding why I'm saying this. But there's, there's something called a spirit of excellence, like in, in everything that we do. And I'm not saying that a spirit of excellence isn't important. I believe that everything we do for God should be done to the very best of our abilities. I believe that. And I want you to know that there's not a week that goes by where as a staff, we're not sitting Monday or Tuesday and talking about what happened Sunday. Because you know what we're going to be talking about tomorrow? Hey, Craig, why does your microphone still pop? Right? We're going to talk, aren't we, Josh? We're going to talk about that tomorrow, right? When we talk about the, hey, how can we do things better? And how can we avoid some things happening? Because we want to be effective and we want to be effective ministers of the gospel. There's nothing wrong with a spirit of excellence. But what I am saying is this a spirit of unity is so much more important than even a spirit of excellence. Because you can be excellent in what you're doing, but if you're not unified with the person you're doing it with, what does it matter? We're not going to be effective. A spirit of unity is of the utmost importance to God. Why? Because it makes the church healthier. It makes the church stronger. It makes the church more effective if we have a spirit of unity. It's good and pleasant when we dwell together in unity, Psalm 133 wants us. Now, some of you may be thinking, you know what, Craig, I really wish you would tell us some of the things that get in the way of spiritual unity. And thank you so much for suggesting that. That's what I'm going to do next in the sermon. I wrote down just a few things that get in the way of our spirit of unity. Here's number one, opinion or preference treated as gospel. You can have your opinion and everybody has their preferences, But that doesn't mean it's gospel in everybody else's life. I mean, it may be a certain way to you, and that's great. And and I'm not saying don't live your life that way. But don't make someone else live their life that way just because that's your opinion and that's your preference. And it causes a spirit of disunity. Here's another one. One's position over another. Well, like, like if, if we're going to walk around and think that we're like holier than thou and we're more important than you and, and I do this, this, and this, and you don't do nearly hardly anything, so you know what, I'm more, that's always going to cause a source of disunity amongst the body of Christ. What about this? Debate. I'm not talking about debating things that should be debated and need to be debated. I'm talking about debating everything. Like everything doesn't have to be a debate. And it causes a spirit of disunity. You know what else does? When someone is wronged. Like there's a lot of people that that get hurt. The church hurts them one way or another. Or someone else in the church hurts them. And instead of fixing that and dealing with that with the person, they'll go to someone else and someone else. And now you have a spirit of disunity. Right? That's how it happens. When someone is gossiped about. If you're having a conversation about someone to anyone but that someone, it's a really good chance that that's gossip. Just say it. Just throwing it out there. And gossip leads to disunity. What about this last one? A critical spirit. Like, and let me me take a minute and just explain this a little further. Because a lot of people will say and argue, no, 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 Craig, I'm just a critical thinker. And there's something to be said about critical thinkers. You you can be a critical thinker. But if all that comes out of your mouth is criticism, you're not a critical thinker. You have a critical spirit. And that causes a source of disunity. These things are are, are true. These things happen. And because we're all human beings, we're going to have to deal with those things and work through those things according to God's word. But the verse says to maintain the unity of the spirit. So the unity of the spirit means things of God, things for God, things because of God. We need to be unified on those particular things. We have to be eager to take the things that are separating us from fellowship and from unity and we need to break those barriers down. What are some examples of those? 
If, if I'm anxious and, and if I don't want a hard truth spoken into my life in love, I need to break that barrier down for the sake of unity. If I don't want to share a hard truth with someone that needs to be shared in love, that's a barrier that needs to be broken down for the sake of unity. As we are walking towards Christ-likeness, there's going to be things that come up. There's going to be things that happen that for the sake of unity, they need to be addressed in a godly, biblical way. Eliminating the flesh as much as humanly possible from the equation. So what are some of the things that we, sh- that we should be going after in unity? And believe it or not, the gauge, the answer to that question is actually found in verses 4, 5, and 6. Here's the things that we should be unified on. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So verses 4 through 6 are describing the changes that are taking place in our life now that we are in Christ. That's the identity that Paul's been talking about in Ephesians. Since we are now in Christ, these changes should be happening. We've been called to one body. It's not this body of Christ over here and another body of Christ over there. No, it's the body of Christ. It's not even a a, a separate body of Christ called Bridgepoint Church and, and a separate body of Christ called another church in the area. No, no, there's one body of Christ. If your identity is in Christ, there is one body by one spirit. There's one hope of salvation, folks. Jesus Christ is the only hope of salvation. There's one hope of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. Our unity towards each other is based off of our unity in Christ. That's what brings us together. We should have unity in the church because we've been united in Christ. And when I say we should have unity in the church, I don't just mean small C church, Bridgepoint. I mean capital C church, the church that makes up the body of believers. We should be united because we're in Christ. We are together in Christ. Now let me press down a little bit on that. Because I don't think this is talking about a unity that differs doctrinally. That's way different, okay? I I, I think that that's clear in the life of Paul. If it's biblical, if it's truth, then we need to be unified on that biblical truth. Let me give you some examples, okay? When someone says that someone has to be baptized in order to be saved, I cannot be unified with that because that changes the gospel for me. That's a big deal. If someone says, you need to have faith in Jesus and do this, this, and this in order to be saved, I can't be unified with that. Why? Because it changes the gospel for me. And the gospel doesn't change. But if someone says, hey, Craig, I believe that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through him, I can be unified with that and I'm going to be. You see the difference? There's a difference in this this unity. We don't have to have unity on everything, but we have to have unity on the right things. On the things that matter the most. On the things that are biblical. Biblical truths. Let me push down just a little bit further and give you another example. I have friends, I have friends who are pastors, and they pastor pretty charismatic and Pentecostal churches. And we have a difference of interpretation when it comes to spiritual gifts. But you know why I can still be unified with that pastor? Because we're both on the same page in regards to the fact that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Jesus Christ is the only one who can forgive sins. So we can still be unified. We can still have fellowship because we are unified on what matters most. Not on something that we we interpret differently that's not going to keep either one of us out of heaven. Okay? 
And, and so we need to understand the difference. But here's what I can't do. I can't go and be unified with someone who believes that Jesus isn't the only way to heaven. Amen. Can't do it. I can't be unified with someone who says, you know what, Craig, I think that some of the Bible is true, but I don't quite know if all the Bible is true. I can't be unified. I can't be unified with that person because we differ doctrinally. That's way different than having a different interpretation about spiritual gifts. But we are called to be unified in Christ. This passage is talking about the unity of the Spirit. Folks, unity is not found in simple agreement. Unity is found in a common identity, in Christ. If you're in Christ and I'm in Christ, we may, be, we may even differ on a few things here or there, but we can still have fellowship and we can still be unified because we both believe with all our heart that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And that's what I'm putting my faith and trust and hope and believe in. I... I really didn't have any intention, but I hope you see how some of the things we're talking about today is going to be so important, regardless of how Tuesday ends up, right? Regardless of whether or not you get the person that you voted for in the White House or not, okay? It's so important that regardless of what happens, that we as Christ followers who want nothing more than to be like Christ, that we are walking around and with all humility and with gentleness and with, with the ability to kind of see the differences in somebody and to understand that, you know what, hey, maybe I may be wrong or maybe I may be a little off in this or that. And, and we treat them with respect still. And because the only thing I know is that I can control what I can control and I can make sure that my position and my practice matches. It matches. Thank you, sweetie. I appreciate that. My new favorite little girl, okay? It has to match. Unity comes when those who are called to live this life from the inside out are walking together in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. That's what matters the most as followers of Jesus Christ. Our position and our practice needs to match. It needs to match. As we enter into our time of communion here on the first Sunday of the month. Can I just, as you take your elements and you prepare them, can I just encourage you to, to bow your heads and close your eyes right there? And some of you are like, well, I don't know how that's going to be possible to prepare my elements. You do the best you can. <laughs> but with every head bowed and every eye closed, you know, obviously this, this time of communion the Bible talks a lot about reflection and remembering. That we reflect on the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and we remember everything that Jesus has done for us. And so with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and, and nobody looking around, can I, just, can I just ask you, can I just encourage you in an attitude of prayer? Will you just tell God, God, thank you for the sacrifice of your son. God, thank you for his death. God, thank you for his shed blood. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin. But then can I encourage you in your prayer? Don't stop there. Continue on with thanking him for the resurrection. Thanking him for the empty tomb. Will you just take a moment just in the quietness of this moment, just to spend some time reflecting and remembering the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ for us because of our sins.
Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for these sweet, sweet moments that we can share where as much as humanly possible, it just kind of feels like the whole world has slowed down more than it's ever going to be able to do in any other setting. And we can lean in and we can really pay attention and we can really express our appreciation for the sacrifice of your son, for the death and the burial of your son. God, we thank you for the payment for our sins. But God, we also thank you for the fact that our hope is in an empty tomb. Our hope is in a resurrected Savior. And God, I pray that you would help us moving forward to be reflective of that. That every single day that you give us to breathe and live on this earth, that we would walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called as Christ followers to be like Jesus. And may we never forget that. And we, may we never not live like it. So God bless this time. We thank you once again for these moments. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Before we partake of communion, I, I just, I always want to be careful. And I always want everyone to understand and everybody be on the same page in regards to communion. You don't, you don't have to be a member of Bridgepoint Church to participate in communion here. But you do have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is reserved. This is a special time for everyone. Not anyone who's lived a perfect life, but anyone who knows that their sins have been forgiven by a perfect Savior. And you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that you know that you know that you're going to heaven for no other reason than I trust in Jesus. If that's the case, if that's happened in your life, then you're welcome to participate in communion. If that hasn't happened in your life, can I just respectfully say, this isn't for you. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're investigating the truths of Christ. But this isn't, this isn't for you. This is for, this is for believers. So if you're a believer this morning, as we think about the body of Christ in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is sharing the Passover meal with his disciples and he institutes the Lord's Supper. And he says this in verse 26, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So as we eat together, let's reflect on the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's all eat together. As you prepare the cup, Matthew continues to write in verse 27, and he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of of sins because without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins so let's remember that let's never forget that as we drink together I want to encourage all of us to stand if you would please at this time and we're going to sing one final song and as we sing this final song we encourage people to, if, the, if the Holy Spirit's stirring if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you if you need to take advantage of this time to, to surrender something to the Lord, submit something to the Lord, if you need to take advantage of this time to thank God for something in your life, let's fill the altars this morning and let's spend some time thanking our God for how great He is. So you come as we sing. <clears throat>